Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Sprint 204 review. Uh, this is a normal two-week sprint that ended on January 23rd, uh, but uh, the sprint review itself is delayed by a week uh, because some people took off uh, for vacation and, um, and some other reasons. Uh, I'll start with the overview. Uh, Jeffrey will do the UI, Adam on providers, Joe on the platform, and Keenan on API. Um, as you can see, this press sprint was a little light. Um, I looked into it, but I couldn't really see why. I think it's because a lot of people are focusing on new features, um, and we're also doing a POC on uh, a new automation system. So a lot of the people that would normally be making regular PRs uh, have been heads down doing other things. Uh, and you can see that reflected in the closed PRs by label and mostly enhancements uh, with a handful of bug fixes. And over to Jeffrey. Uh, hi, uh, good morning. In the sprint, uh, uh, six PRs got merged in the UI Classic repo, out of which uh, two are bugs, three are enhancements, and uh, one technical tip. I can explain about them in the following slides. Uh, the G GitHub actions were failing in the Classic repo, and uh, Jason had created a PR to remove the Google Chrome beta entry from the Jasmine helper to fix this problem. Uh, next slide. Uh, when the create database uh, backup feature was removed to the uh, physical appliances, there were an error regarding few undefined variables while trying to edit a schedule. Akilat fixed this by uh, removing the file depot detail from the edit actions. Next slide. The auto ST team added a host initiator group information in the storage manager dashboard. Next slide. Uh, the auto ST team had also introduced the enable capabilities row in the storage uh, summary page. Next slide. Uh, auto ST team introduced uh, the basic and ad advanced modes in the storage manager forms. Uh, next slide. Uh, for the PR, the uh, SC VMM provider depended on the uh, Win RM gem and uh, WMI library, which is no longer updated or maintained. Uh, this prevented us from moving to CentOS Steam Stream 9 as the WMI library does not compile. Adam made some changes in the automation engine repo and classic repo for this. Slide. Uh, that's all from the UI. Over to Adam. All right, thanks, Jeffrey. Uh, so yeah, for all the reasons that Jeffrey just mentioned, uh, we dropped the SCVMM provider. Uh, with regards to core, a lot of this was just references to uh, SCVMM type objects in uh, in core, mostly in specs. Uh, there are a couple references in uh, app models code, but mostly in specs to you know VM Microsoft uh, type objects. So it was switching those over to the generic infra type uh, for the most part. There was some interesting code that had to get refactored and actually uh, improve the overall experience for um, chargeback. Specifically, SCVMM didn't have metric support, and there was some hard-coded support for chargeback without uh, without cap new metrics. Um, what really they wanted to say was, does this provider uh, support collecting metrics? And so we were able to, uh, as part of this removal, get that bug fixed up. So now uh, other infra providers, which don't collect uh, cap new metrics, to do just allocation-based chargeback as well. So that was a nice uh, bug fix that fell out of uh, shaking the tree a little bit. So for auto SDE, uh, Gal added capabilities to the storage resources object so that they can track what is uh, available as um, uh, enabled and disabled features for the different storage objects. They also improved the uh, volume create uh, by filtering out uh, uh, properties that aren't able to be selected. And uh, once a volume was created, they fixed a bug where uh, gathering the IDs for targeted refresh wasn't uh, pulling the IDs from the proper uh, location, so it wasn't finding anything. Next slide. Uh, for Intersight, Cisco Intersight, we added it to the capabilities matrix. While we were looking at it, we noticed it wasn't in the uh, physical infrastructure providers section, so we added it there. Uh, as well as checking off everything which it uh, supported and didn't support. 
for OpenStack, we fixed a bug where the port uh, that you prov provided in the form wasn't being honored. And so it was possible that you could enter the wrong port uh, when you went to create or edit the provider and it would succeed and pass verify, but uh, the instance level, which is what runs on the schedule later on, would fail as it was supposed to have failed because the port was wrong. And so it would look like everything was added successfully, but nothing would get refreshed. Uh, and it was due to a discrepancy in how the port was being uh, passed down to the uh, verification code. So we got that fixed up as a uh, pretty pretty confusing one if you're a user and you hit this because it looked like it should have been fine, but it wasn't. Uh, again, OpenShift or sorry, OpenStack is one of those weird ones where they uh, use different code paths for the instance and the class level verify. So that's just another reason why we need to get that fixed up. So add that to the list. Uh, OpenShift continuing with dropping uh, older and supported uh, versions and, and providers now. So we dropped OCP v3 support as uh, Red Hat no longer provides support for it. This allowed us to uh, clean up a pretty significant amount of other code because the APIs for OpenShift v3 and v4 are completely different. And so we were able to drop a bunch of uh, logical code paths that we were maintaining for quite some time. Next slide. And for VMware, we're now uh, for the non-Rails worker, for the non-Rails event catcher. Uh, we're using the uh, normalized worker settings from Core, which just allows us to uh, drop a couple of dependencies and uh, make it a lot simpler for provider authors to be able to get uh, worker settings in a in a format that they're able to use. Specifically, this is around converting integers from a string like you know ten dot minutes to the actual um, you know six hundred seconds that you'd be able to use, and also uh, decrypting passwords so that. Uh, you don't have to have access to the V2 key as a as a non-Rails worker. Uh, we also fixed a bug with an uninitialized constant uh, when going to verify host credentials. This was due to some refactoring that caused the uh, host verify credentials path to be uh, the same as the um, to be the same as the EMS one, and that introduced some bugs uh, due to not testing with a uh, not testing verify credentials with the host. And that is it for providers. I would jump. Okay, uh, for core enhancements, Brandon added a default container security context. Uh, Nassar added some of the logic around starting workers for his work on a non-Rails workers and setting the correct status. Adam enhanced the plugin generator to default to using the override gem with the local gem, as it won't exist in the manage.iq org when you're creating it initially. Uh, Adam also added the service UI native console product feature. Next slide. For core bugs, Keenan fixed an issue where Rails 6171 uh, was released and changed some defaults around a possible security issue. So he um, temporarily resolved that for us. And Jason fixed a few RPM build issues to use a, a correct executable path and ensure the source is checked out when building. Next slide. Onto the API. Okay, cool. So uh, for an enhancement over in the API, uh, we added support for, um, or Adam, uh, hat trick, uh, added support for uh, querying the native console um, protocol. Okay, onto next. All right, that's the end of the Sprint 204 review. The next review, Sprint 205, will be next week, February 8th, um, and we'll be at the usual place and time. And once again, I'd like to thank everyone in the community. Uh, all the contributors to manage IQ, all the people testing out, um, and we'll see you next time.